Hello and welcome fellow travelers. I'm Chris Abernathy and today we're going to be talking about God and the existence of evil. How do we reconcile these two ideas, the one of an all-good loving God who cares for us and the very existence of evil and suffering in this world? So I want to invite you on this journey with me, one of hope, encouragement, and discovery, Seeking the Way. Now, as a Christian, we're called to trust in God as the source of all moral good. And yet, there are things that we experience in this life that can make it difficult to reconcile these ideas. Murder, pain, homelessness, natural disasters, all these things that fall under the umbrella of suffering seem to fly in the face of a loving, caring, personal God. So how do we settle these? First, I want to say that it's okay to not know the answers to these very complex questions, but they absolutely can have relevance for us. So before we get into specifically answering this one objection, I want to talk about why we're covering these series of objections at all. And the first reason is that it can have an effect on our personal faith. So if we don't take time to study the Bible, to learn about God, to even consider some of these questions, we may find that when we are posed these questions and we're not prepared, they can affect our faith. So if you've never considered this idea, well, how do we reconcile God and suffering? But you're talking to a non-believer, maybe you're evangelizing to them, and they bring up this question. If you're not prepared to answer it, well, not only can that affect your ability to evangelize to them, but that can affect your own faith. Because this is absolutely a relevant question. In fact, I would venture to say, and there are many others who agree, that this is one of the most important objections that we as Christians need to consider and potentially prepare ourselves to answer. So if we can't reconcile this idea for other people, it could potentially start to have an effect on our own personal faith. But then the flip side is that is something that I just talked about, is the ability to evangelize. If we are prepared to answer such objections as these, we can have confidence when we go out and spread the good news to other people. When we know that these questions are going to come up and we're prepared to answer them, that can give us confidence to go out into the world. I've said it before, but 1 Peter 3.15 says to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in your heart. And the primary thing like to focus on for this is to be prepared. We have to prepare some of these answers, not that they have to be canned, but we have to equip ourselves intellectually, spiritually, to be able to give a hope that is in our heart. So let's begin today's journey. So the existence of suffering is perhaps the greatest objection that a Christian can face. This question and how we answer it can have profound effects on our faith. Now typically when we're talking about suffering or evil, there's two kinds. It's split up into two categories. You have evil, which typically encompasses anything to do with one person to another. So we're talking about stealing, murdering, any sort of that is, is considered evil. And then we have this other side of it that's natural suffering. So that's natural disasters, that's diseases, that's maybe famine that comes about as a result of a dry season. And each of these has a different kind of answer. So the first one is evil. Now, St. Augustine, who you may know as St. Augustine, his view on this is that evil was the privation of good. So he believed that evil was what happened when we no longer had good in our hearts. It was like this natural degradation. As we went about in life, if we did not follow God, then we would lose the good and evil would exist. But that kind of gave the idea that evil was somehow inherent to us. And eventually he would come to question this idea because that would mean that God created us with evil in our hearts. And we know that's not the case. And really, the best answer for the existence of evil comes in the form of our free will. Our ability to choose that God-given ability is what introduced evil in the first place. 
Eve's ability to choose to do what she was tempted to do is what led her to sin. Now, free will is a very important aspect of this. Because if we didn't have free will, we wouldn't be able to freely choose a relationship with God, which is what he wants. Because there's not a single relationship in this lifetime that if one party is forced into it, we consider good. So a couple examples would be mail-order brides. We look down upon those because people are basically being sold. Any sort of human trafficking. But then we romanticize these relationships, such as Romeo and Juliet, where you have these two people who can never love, but it's their choice to love each other. We romanticize these ideas where free will is on display. Because if God forced us into a relationship with him, he would be a tyrant. Now, when it comes to natural suffering, it really comes in the form of a broken creation. God created this world for us to live in and exist in, and it was perfect. But the problem is that when we introduce sin, it literally broke his creation. So natural disasters, volcanoes, all these things come about as a result of that broken creation. And there's another aspect of this, like this natural suffering idea that there's no virtue without suffering. What I mean by that is that if things were good all the time, if everything was good, nothing would be. Because there's a standard by which to measure the good or badness of something. So I'm not saying that God introduced natural suffering. That did come about as a result of our our introducing sin into the world. But once sin was introduced, once we had to learn to love God and to love other people, that's what we eventually became called to do. We wouldn't be able to do that if things were good all the time. There is no virtue without suffering. If things were good for everybody all the time, we would never look outside of ourselves and at other people to see that they were suffering. We would never have to sacrifice anything because everybody would be good all the time. There's a natural part of the love that God calls us to that is sacrificial in nature. To look outside of ourselves and look at the people around us and lift them up and help them. That is part of our growth. That's part of our discipleship. To put our own needs and desires aside and help other people. So when we're talking about God, when we're looking at this idea of an all-good God and evil the answer that we provide for these questions have to take into consideration the three attributes that are typically attributed to God. And the first is that he's all-powerful or that he's omnipotent. The second is that he's all-knowing or omniscient. And the third is that he's all-good or omnibenevolent. And so when it comes to the first attribute, all-powerful, the question that usually comes up is, can't he just stop the evil? But we've kind of already answered that. Could he stop the evil? Uh, yes, he is capable. But in doing that, there would be no growth for us. We wouldn't look at other people and see that they're suffering. But there would also be without those things. If everything was good all the time, then we wouldn't even have passions, really. We would be stuck in this monotonous life. Now, there is a difference between if everything was good without God and if everything is good with God, because God is good. I've been asked this question before when I brought this up. Well, then what about heaven? If, if, if that's the case, heaven can't be that good. Well, that's different because in heaven, we are in God's presence. We are in the presence of the literal embodiment of good. God is the ultimate standard by which to apply things to. And so that doesn't really apply when it comes to heaven. So the next attribute, all-knowing omniscient. The question that usually comes up here is, if he knows what's going to happen, doesn't that mean that we don't actually have free will? And to this, I would say that foreknowledge of an event does not equal causation of that event. So that is to say that just because God knows something is going to happen doesn't mean he causes it to happen. And the best example that I could come up with is with my kids. Now, I have a 10, 7, and 4-year-old. And if I went to the 4-year-old and I held out an apple and a piece of candy, and I can say, you, and I said, you can have either of these things. Whatever you want, it's your choice. I know he's going to pick the piece of candy. 
there is no doubt in my mind that he's going to pick the piece of candy, but that does not mean that I force him to pick the piece of candy. And I think this question usually comes from a maybe an uninformed view of God's relationship with time. And this is kind of a, a complex concept, but we exist in time. We have a present, which is every single second. We have a past, which is the previous second and beyond, and we have a future that has not yet come. We exist within a time. God does not exist that way. God exists outside of time. He is beyond time. And so his relationship to time is different. So his knowing something is going to happen does not mean that he's forcing it to happen. And I like to view our lives as every single moment we have a choice of left or right. Every single moment is a choice. And God just knows which choice we're going to make at every single moment. That doesn't mean he makes it happen because obviously he would rather that everybody choose him. He would rather that everybody not go out and steal things, not people not murder, people not hate people. God's not forcing those things to happen, but he knows what we're going to choose. And lastly is God's being all good, his omnibenevolence. And kind of falling under this is this idea that when we have free will and we choose him of our own free will, that is a pure relationship right there. When we decide, hey, okay, there's enough going on here. I want to try this Jesus thing. I'm convinced that he was real and I'm going to give it a shot. When you feel that and you enter into a true relationship with him, you are going to be more inclined toward his goodness. That relationship is pure. And so free will is the only answer to this idea and this problem of evil that it can also account for all of these three of God's attributes, his omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnibenevolence. So another question that I've gotten a lot with regards to this is why can't God just have created a world without suffering? And we've talked about, again, we've talked about this a little bit with regards to if everything's good, then nothing is. But I would also say that God did create a world without suffering and we broke it. We are the ones who introduce sin into the world. Now, I have to take a step back and say that the enemy does play a role in this. It's the temptation of being like God that introduced sin into the world. It's idolatry. And so if I go back to the candy versus the apple, I am tempting my child with this piece of candy. And I know that they're going to pick it. That's what the enemy does. He comes into our lives and he tempts us with pieces of candy. But that's what broke this wonderful world that God created for us. But the amazing thing is that he knew we would. Again, going back to his all-knowing ability, he knew from the very beginning, before he even made us, he knew what would happen. He knew what kind of bad decisions. He knows what bad decision you are going to make tomorrow. But he yearned for us so much that he made us Anyway, and from the very beginning, before time, before he created the universe, he had a plan to redeem us back to him. That's how much God loves us. Now, I've also been asked, well, doesn't God share some responsibility in the evil? After all, he made everything. He made this whole thing. He made the people. He made the environment that would lead to these circumstances that lead us to sin. I don't think that's a fair argument because in our society, when someone commits a crime, who is held responsible? Well, it's the individual who committed the crime. We don't hold the founder of the town responsible. We don't hold the mayor of the town responsible. It's the individual who committed the crime that is sentenced, you know, according to a jury of their peers, blah, blah, blah. But it's the individual who is held responsible for their actions. Now, we as parents, we do have some responsibility for our children as they grow, but when they become adults, they are held responsible for their own actions. When they hit 18, they are tried as adults if they're committing crimes. And the same applies with us and God. Paul constantly calls us to move beyond spiritual infants into spiritual maturity. When we know better, when we've grown up, when we've reached that age of maturity, we are held responsible for our own actions and sins. 
But that's exactly why we need Jesus. And the mere fact that there appears to be a standard by which we apply a level of good or bad to something seems to show that there is like this innate sense of right and wrong. For something is only good if there is a standard by which to apply it. Now, in my undergraduate studies in philosophy, we took a class on ethics, and I was extremely interested in this idea of an innate sense of right and wrong. And I wanted to see how far this went. And I found studies and videos that were conducted on children as young as three months old that showed that they had a predetermination toward the right action. They were more inclined to something good than to something bad at that young. And so we get this idea of right and wrong, but God is that standard of right and wrong by which to apply things. I had a discussion with a friend of mine, and he was an unbeliever. And he believed that it was okay for every community, every society to decide what was right and wrong to them. And I said, okay, let me pose a scenario to you then. Let's say that there's a neighborhood that gets to decide what's right and wrong to them. And they're just real tired of this one neighbor, Gary. He's really obnoxious. He just comes out with his robe open to get his newspaper every day. He's, you know, really grumpy. So they decide, you know what? We're tired of Gary. We're going to kill Gary. Is everybody in agreement? Okay. Yeah, okay. That's right, yeah. Okay, let's go kill Gary. I said, would that be right? And he said, well, no, absolutely not. But I was like, but you just said that every society and every culture gets to determine what's right and wrong. Why is it that that is wrong? And it's this idea of like a violation of the individual sovereignty of the person. But we get that because each person has a spark of the divine image from God. Also, God has this uh, crazy ability to, like, make good come from evil. The Bible said that God will work all things for his good. Now, I have to focus on this a little bit because we have to focus on the word his good. Admittedly, sometimes things aren't going to work out for our good. But if we keep our eyes on him through hard circumstances, they will work out for his good. And if they work out for his good, then it works out for everybody's greater good. And this is this idea of a sacrificial love. When we focus on him in hard circumstances, we build the kingdom of heaven, and that is good for everybody. But the great thing is that God doesn't just expect this of us. He's not a hypocrite. He doesn't just say, hey, you need to do this. These things need to be done. You have to go out and do these things. You have to do sacrificial love. No, he did it. He displayed it. He provided an example. And that example is in the form of Jesus on the cross. Evil was committed on Jesus. Jesus was murdered for something that he was entirely innocent of. But because of that moment of evil, the greatest good in human history has happened. Because Jesus was murdered, We are all saved. So this addresses evil on a general level, but what about like a more specific level? What about like knowing that God allows people to make their own decisions doesn't like negate the pain when a loved one passes unexpectedly? C.S. Lewis, who is the author of Narnia, if you didn't know, he's also a very famous apologetic. He said that God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. There's a reason why we were made for community. There's a reason why we as Christians are made to be a part of the body of Christ. When people ask, well, what's God doing then? What's he doing to help us in these times of suffering, of evil? What is he doing? How could he? I've heard that before too. How could he? And the best answer that I can give you, brothers and sisters, is that you were made for those situations. 
What did God do? He made you. You see somebody, some homeless person that needs food, he made you for that situation. He made you to help the helpless. He made you to protect the weak, to give hope to the hopeless, to stand up in the face of evil. You were made for those moments. Every single moment of our lives, you 